gotten a place to be hosting our ninth event on building with natural materials, this time the fifth of our masterclasses, Building with Lime. We've got some great minds from across the industry presenting tonight, followed by a panel session where speakers will be able to answer your questions posted in the chat box. So I would like to introduce Ed Walker from the Cornish Lime Company. Ed will introduce us to Lime as a building material from a technical point of view. Then we'll hear from Tom Robinson from Adaptivate. He will tell us how they are trying to make Lime easy to use in the industry. And then finally, Barbara Jones from the School of Natural Building will introduce us to LimeCrete and share some of her case studies with us. But before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN and some are involved in the network, but for the benefit of the others in the room, Andy would give us a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. So over to Andy. Uh, hi everyone, um, for anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Uh, it was for, ACAN was formed in 2013 and has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started with a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our, man our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. Uh, you can read a bit more detail about these here and on the ACAN website. ACAN is made up of many groups, including these nine main thematic groups of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen and a couple of people from each group take, on, take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and any actions. You can hear more about what else is going on in the other groups by joining ACAN, and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box. Back to Aurora to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Andy. Um, so I would like to introduce our first speaker of the night. Um, Ed is the technical director of the Cornish Lime Company. He has worked over there for um, over nine years. Ed runs the lab that creates new materials and tests current materials and products. Ed currently sits on the BSI panels for both lime and mortar, having recently joined through a sponsorship by the BLF. Um, over to Ed. Great. Um, let me just share my screen a second. You will see that? Perfect. Thank you. Great. So yeah, um, first speaker of the day, um, looking just to uh, cover some of the basics of sort of Lime, what it is, what it's about. Um, uh, as Rory already said, um, I am, uh, I am the, the technical director of the Cornish Lime Company. I am a materials chemist by trade. Um, I sit on both the BLF and the MPA technical panel members, the BLF building being the Building Limes Forum as a conservation group and the um, MPA being one of the biggest representatives for uh, construction material manufacturers in the UK. Um, and through them, I do various sort of um, wordy legal work um, and sort of help put standards together. So, so first things first, what is lime? Um, there are multiple types of lime currently on the European market and they're covered by a European standard. Um, it will become a British standard or has become a British standard now. Have sort of mostly grouped into sort of two main categories. The first one is a non hydraulic lime. This is a material uh, where if you were to mix this as a mortar and place this underwater, it would never set, it would never harden. The only way that this material will actually sort of pick up strength and develop is uh, through carbonation, so reabsorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, hydraulic limes, which is kind of the other class within the main part of the standard, is, uh, are, are a bit more uh, wide ranging because they, they kind of have a, a few different types. The first one would be a natural hydraulic lime or, or commonly known as an NHL. These materials are made by um, taking a uh, naturally occurring source limestone, which has a silica or a clay content. This is then cooked. Um, it's uh, put through a grinder and slaked and bagged. Um, the reason that these sort of clay and silica um, is, is necessary for this to be present is it combines with the limestone in order to give you the chemicals which then give you a hydraulic lime. Hydraulic lime having a chemical set. So if you to, again, do you mix this as a mortar and place it underwater, this stuff would actually set and harden. However, the carbonation part would still be carbon dioxide, so it's not fully set and hardened until it has had that air get to it. Um, formulated limes is another 
less common one, but you do see it occasionally. It's basically any of the lines where you've had a POSLAN added to it. Um, I will cover what POSLANs are in the next slide. Um, and then finally, you do see hydraulic limes. Now, these are typically lime and cement blends. Um, so true lime, what is arguable, it is uh, a classification that exists within the standard. Um, POSLANs are a very useful class of material. Um, they're effectively something that which you consume free lime, calcium hydroxide, in order to give a, that some of that chemical set that you might have with a hydraulic in a different fashion. Um, they're often used in, in modern Portland cements, but at the same time, they can be used in heritage applications or to change the, uh, the, the technical performance of various types of lime and water. Um, to sort of give you an, a, a very... Sorry, we seem to have lost Ed. Let's try to... Okay. Ed, um, we can't really hear you. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, we can hear you now. You can hear me okay, okay. Yeah, we can um, hear you. Sorry, I think my, I think my, um, my camera's... So, let me just go back a slide a second. Um, so, just sort of very briefly covering the lime cycle. You'll start with your source limestone, your calcium carbonate. Through cooking or calcining this, you will then drive off your carbon dioxide uh, and you will create quicklime, a very exothermically reactive material which will release a lot of heat when you add water to it. Um, this will give you a, an air lime in this sort of lime cycle, which will then reabsorb carbon dioxide after being used as mortar to go back to limestone. Now, the difference between a hydraulic lime and a natural hydraulic lime is that during this calcination phase, some of those clays present in the limestone will combine with the lime itself in order to give you the hydraulic part. Now, this hydraulic part will never reabsorb that carbon dioxide. So typically, the weaker, um, higher free lime content mixes do reabsorb more carbon dioxide. Um, a very brief overview of the history of lime. I mean, it's been around for in excess of 7,000 years that of just that what we know of. Um, I mean, when you're looking at sort of how lime has changed even within the last few hundred years, you start to see development of kiln design and changes in, in going from weaker to uh, stronger hydraulic lines as you start to get into more sort of civils type um, construction or anything with a harbour or, or construction of the railways. Um, and I mean, even sort of Portland cement, the early Portland cements would have been no more than, than what would be modern, sort of a modern day NHL 5 really. Um, but you do seem to see this sort of um, drop in the, the use of lime um, around the turn of uh, around the turn of just after the turn of the century, where um, you you have basically uh, the reconstruction of Britain after World War One and World War Two. Um, so why use lime? First and foremost, um, it's breathable. I mean, it is a material which manages moisture, and in sort of modern or historic construction, there are various issues with with moisture management. The image on the left is uh, uh, from Dartwell Prison. It's effectively an area where they have a thin, slender section of, of solid wall masonry where they have a gypsum plaster and a waterproof paint. Um, in this instance, the waterproof paint has just completely bubbled away and has held so much water in the plaster that the plaster has also failed as well. Um, on the right hand side, this is actually a house quite local to where I live. Um, the impervious cement pointing has prevented that moisture which has gotten into the wall from escaping through the joints. So instead, it transfers through the stone. So through a process of sort of a, a freeze thaw action as well as salt degradation, the stone is actually now weathered back from what was previously the flat face of the wall. That's not actually a fancy style of pointing. Um, BRE research to suggest that dampness accounted for uh, more than 50% of all building defects. And that was a study from 1987. If you keep in mind that within the UK, um, over the last 30 years alone, there are certain parts of the UK, especially as you're going north towards Scotland, where rainfall has doubled in the last 30 years. Even here in Cornwall, where I'm based, we're seeing somewhere around a, a 50 to 60 percent increase in rain. So you can pretty much be sure that that 50 percent figure is higher now. So breathable mortars, they allow water to escape. They can help to prevent dampness. They can help to prevent stone decay. However, there are other benefits as well. Um, you tend to find that they are more flexible, having a better modulus, modulus of elasticity. This can help to reduce cracking if um, design around uh, lintels and window are, are sort of uh, focused on to prevent um, sort of stress cracking around lintels. And it does help to improve the recyclability of masonry. If you, it's better to not have to knock a full building down and take everything to the rubble pile if you could reclaim 50 to 60% or even higher of the brick content of a building. Um, 
it has a reabsorption of carbon dioxide, obviously variable depending on the different type of lime. Um, and this is coupled with a lower cooking temperature than what would be a modern Portland cement, being more around 900 to 1000 degrees rather than sort of the 1500, which would be a modern Portland cement. There is lots of historical precedents, precedents and evidence to show that it works. I mean, the, the history speaks for itself more than anything else. Um, the multiple materials available is very useful because it means that there are a, a multitude of different sort of applications and you can just draw from this wonderful palette of different types of lime, even sort of natural cements all the way through to the, the, the true sort of, um, you know, super high free lime content um, conservation type products. Um, and to be honest, the best thing about it is that pretty much any trade person can use it if they understand the differences between it and modern materials, aftercare being the most important aspect. What a lot of people sort of uh, think is that they can just like modern types of products, slap it on a wall and walk away. Um, with lime, you do need to have the aftercare because the strength development is quite considerably slower than most modern products. So to give you a very brief overview of some of the types of sort of mortars we'd be looking at on a day in day, day out basis. Um, so you've got two non hydraulic mortars here, a quick lime mortar and a lime putty mortar. You can see they're both relatively weak. But at the same time, they also have a very high water absorption capacity, water, um, capillary water absorption, and they also have a very high uh, vapor permeability. Um, this being resistance measurement, so lower is better, or lower is, is more in that sense. Um, as you start to get into the more hydraulic materials, NHL2 being uh, more feeble than NHL3.5, you start to see the compressive strength increases, but at the same time, your water absorption will decrease compared to your real high lime content type mixes and the vapor permeability will decrease as well. These two figures being some sort of part of what breathability is. Now, that being said, you can take these hydraulic mortars and if you design them carefully and you, you use selected aggregates, you can make them more porous, you can make them more vapor permeable, but it becomes a little bit specialist. And it's the kind of things that we get asked to make now in um, for the more sort of specialist conservation type work. Um, so where do we see NIME in new build and retrofit? Um, from our personal experience of retailing it, um, it goes into eco-build projects. It's chosen for aesthetic reasons. Um, it, it, for a certain amount of time, it has been sort of um, to do with embodied carbon content. Um, people are looking to use materials with lower embodied carbon contents. Um, and also sort of breathable materials, especially if you're looking at breathable insulation materials, um, help to improve living environments. You wind up with less issues with condensation. You wind up with less mold and effectively less damp as a result. Um, the other thing, and, and you know, this is a, a sort of from the more commercial point of view, is that marketing and the more availability of modern products which are lime based is a very big driver. If you put heritage type materials into the hands of a modern plasterer who's never been educated in how to use them or what the mix ratios you needs are, then it, it will scare people off. Um, if you're taking somebody who's only ever worked with skim where they will open the bag add water and then use that as a product if you can give them a product which is lime based so that they can use it in a similar kind of way they're much more likely to actually try those new types of materials um and just as a, a point there not all modern lime products are cement free as i did allude to earlier uh, hydraulic limes are lime and cement blends so what's coming in the future from us specifically um, we do a lot of research and development. We do a lot of research and development with other companies as well. Um, we are looking for uh, better breathable insulating products. We're actually looking at a series of uh, new insulating board systems at the moment. Um, we are working on machine sprayable new renders um, for new build applications. They will, at the moment, we're designing them to be NHL based, so natural hydraulic lime based. Um, but these are the types of things that um, are going to be going through sort of like PFTG4 type machines, so mix and spray, um, sort of much more modern uh, application methods than sort of more traditional stuff. Um, we've been asked several times to make Portland free, uh, as Portland cement free, non NHL new build products. It's quite challenging. We have been working on it for a little while, but it's not there yet. Um, we are currently testing another new replacement for plastic fibers and hair, obviously trying to reduce the quantity of plastic present in materials. At the same time, hair for the, the heritage market is fine, but for the new mode market is, is less appropriate. Um, and we've just finished developing a, a new range of um, Portland cement free marine mortars. Um, these things are, are typically a blend of either 
natural hydraulic lime or they can be pozlan and lime or in certain circumstances we are using natural cements um the this was quite a, a big and exciting project and we're, we're basically got to the point where we should be releasing it fairly soon um and we are you know we're working with certain partners to look at low and body carbon building products um i do think going forward epds and lcas will be getting bigger and bigger there are certain government projects that require epds nowadays so um it is something that we are going to have to look at in the very near future and then finally um we've been looking at new bleach and acid free cleaners for lime we actually think we found one now which has the added benefit of also being somewhat biodegradable um we are not quite there we're about at the, at the point of putting all the literature together we think we found the product itself um this is not one that we'd be manufacturing this is one we'd be retailing um but yeah it you know as as a part of sort of r d work we will have to bring in different products to actually see what works with the products that we manufacture as well so yeah that's pretty much me done thank you very much thank you very much ed that was great um so if you have any questions for Ed, just put them in the chat box now and uh, we'll ask that at the end at, uh, during the Q&A session. So next we've got Tom Robinson from Adaptivate. So Tom is a former builder specialising in restoration of a historic building in the UK. He studied a Master's in Sustainable Architecture at the Centre for Alternative Technology, where he developed a biocomposite board as an alternative to plastic board. This was the start of Adaptivate. He is also an industry speaker and lecturer at his former university, focusing on disruptive business models, building physics and transforming the construction industry. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? All good, thank you. Oh, good. Well, I guess, first of all, I hope B's okay. I'm sorry she couldn't join you all this evening, but um, you're stuck with me for 10 minutes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but also thanks very much to ACAN for the uh, the work that you guys do. Um, it's really great to be part of this um, this evening's event. What I'm going to be looking on is really following on from what Ed was talking about um, in terms of that introduction on where the industry is going and look at how Adaptivate are working to really make lime based, uh, healthy, low carbon um, building materials for the mainstream market uh, that are easy to use easy to specify uh, and for everyone around the world. And let's see if I can move here. So at the moment there's a big tunnel vision towards net zero. We need building materials now, we need them you know, low carbon, cheaper, easier to install, easier to specify when we need them now. And, and we have to remember when we strive towards EPDs, what actually people are meaning is they want a kilogram of CO2 equivalent per unit of whatever they're buying. And, and once, if we get tunnel vision at the, that can really actually cause some quite significant negative and intended consequences. And so what we try and do is really think about the holistic picture. An EPD doesn't just have one metric, it has 36 or so um, different metrics. And, and we need to remember people live in these buildings. It's not just about carbon. So what Adaptivate do, I used to be a builder um, and I have developed these uh, or had a hand in developing these materials for the mainstream market. Uh, our materials are drop-in alternatives that can be made on industrial processes. And really what we're focused on is transitioning the, the construction sector from a very kind of take, make, waste linear material flow to something that's more regenerative um you know ecologically regenerative renewable uh, carbon absorbing um creating high performance building materials that are easy to use that are good for our people good for our buildings and good for our planet and we work with some with the ukri we are co-funded by we work with the bre fis and also cornish line that, that where ed's just been speaking from as well and it's these trusted partnerships that really enable us to think about how we scale our business uh, around the world. Um, so we, what, what we really consider is innovative products on innovative processes to be able to scale these business models around the world. And if we can take three really core principles, which is easy to use, easy to specify products that are high performance or healthy for people and buildings, and that can be low, or our ambition is to be carbon negative, through the development of our formulations and processes to be if we can bring those three things together at industrial scale then we can create genuinely ecologically regenerative businesses of the future that can be ecologically regenerative and economically profitable and that can be a good thing and so that's really what adaptivates focused on 
Um, what we are, what we have is two, two main products. Uh, one is our breather board, which is a direct alternative to plasterboard. Um, we've just raised a round of investment. We're building a pilot line here in Bristol. If you'd like an invitation, drop me a line. Uh, that'll be opening later in the year and we'll be having a big opening event uh, with a barbecue and uh, a tour. Um, but uh, our first, we are, we are seeking pilot projects for that, for our breather board. Uh, in in 2023. So please do reach out to me directly if you think you've got a relevant pilot project that you'd like to be involved in with that. Breather Plaster is really the focus for this, um, this conversation today. And that is a dry bagged lime based plaster that comes in a bag on a pallet, just add water, trying to make it super easy for the mainstream market and for people that have not used lime before. Um, be you a gypsum plasterer or be you um, a homeowner that just wants to have a cracking, you know, a cr a, get, have a crack. Our products are distributed through uh, national um, distribution frameworks through SIG, um, but also Travis Perkins. Um, and we have two new plaster products coming to the market. And this is a bit of a sneak preview, so don't tell anyone, but, and, and it's not final branding, okay? But uh, Breather Plaster Universal is what you'll know as Breather Plaster that we all know and love on the market. Uh, that's been on there for four, four years or so. We've got two new products coming in the next few months. One is a thermal, uh, highly insulative thermal base coat, it's fast setting. Uh, means you can build up the U value and thermal performance of a wall very easily. Um, so you can set, each coat can be built up 40, 40 mil or 50 mil and be set in you know, to, to build another coat on in two hours. And then we've got this super smooth um, top coat, which is basically to try and rival multi-finished, which is essentially a super smooth skim coat um, to go with our breather plaster universal and thermal coats. We are looking for um, projects over the next three to four months. We'll be actually on shelves, branded sacks, hopefully by the end of the year, um, supply chain issues pending. So what is breather plaster? We're looking at breather plaster universal here. The product has been on the market for the last four years. It's basically lime plaster made easy. It's quick setting. It's got the same setting time as gypsum multi-finish, um, but it's got uh, a much better thermal performance, twice the thermal performance. It absorbs pollutants. And most importantly, it's called breather plaster because it breathes with the people in the building. So it's passively regulating the moisture that's created. So I can put in this room, I can put a whole load of washing and my walls here have got about four or five mil of breather plaster on. I can put a whole load of washing in here, dry them out, and there's no condensation on the on, on the on the windows because that, that material is, is absorbing and desorbing. And that means that it can be a breathable skin of the building on the inside onto a non-breathable substrate, for instance, for the mainstream market. Or if you were trying to retrofit breathable buildings, solid wall buildings, breather plaster can be part of a breathable compatible system. It's uh, CE marked and uh, UKCA marked to be uh, to be finalized in A1 fire rating. So really this is a this is a performance plaster made easy. Breather plaster universal also goes on to a multitude of different substrates. So it's really relevant for retrofit. It's really relevant relevant for restoration and renovation. But it's also really relevant for new build. Um, and particular our, our smooth coat will just be a super smooth finish. And that means that this product is a really versatile, easy to use um, product and builders love it because they can just bring one bag onto site and they can just use that on a multitude of different, different substrates. It's a plant powered plaster, so it's a bioplaster. So it contains around 30% um, very, very fine industrial hemp particles. Um, hemp's a wonderful crop. Um, and that gives this product thermal properties, moisture buffering properties, this breathability that we were talking about, but also this ability to have like a natural stylish textured look. And that's something that a lot of interior design uh, clients like. So our products, as I say, breather, breather plaster, that, that kind of porous structure within the lime um, plaster, uh, that the, the, the biomaterial helps. Uh, achieve really it, it gives the walls lungs to breathe with the people in the building passively regulating that moisture that's created through cooking and cleaning and that sort of thing it can also increase the, the temperature of the wall which of course in turn reduces mold and condensation and so the the combination of this high lung capacity if you like and the fact that it's got a thermal value really significantly reduces the risk of mold and condensation this is some testing that we do, we've done with the University of Bath, which looks at how much water, our, oh, how much water vapor our, our materials can absorb at around 80% relative humidity. 
we were surprised by the capacity. Um, this is a static test, not a dynamic test, but it's a it has a significant capacity to absorb water vapor at, at high relative humidity. But most importantly, we're trying to make materials that are easy for people to use. And so you get all the performance of lime, you get that breathability, but you have to have, make it easy for people. And if you look at two other lime plasters for the inside of buildings here, and I'm not going to mention any names of this, but because of this setting time being 45 minutes between coats, it means that breather plaster can be finished within a, a few hours, which is the same as, as gypsum multi-finish. And that can be twice that in comparison to lime, uh, other lime plasters. When you look at that in terms of product cost and all in cost, the industry as we know is, you know, only really 30 to 40% of the, of the cost of any project is actual product. Actually, it's the all in cost, including the labor and the installation that's the, that, that's, the, that, that's the time taking thing. And so when you look at product cost in isolation, it's a one dimensional story. You really have to consider this installation timings and that's where Breather Plaster and our approaches in terms of our line based plasterboard and, and, and our plasters really come into its own. So this is onto plasterboard. You can just skim our, our, our product straight onto, our, onto, um, onto plasterboard. And you can see here, there's around a 30% labor saving in, in comparison to our closest competitor. This is based on a few assumptions down at the bottom. If you then look onto masonry wall, again, you can get a really significant 30% saving here um, in comparison to other products. And that's for the kind of more retrofit um, arena, uh, where of course speed of time on site is a big key driver. And this is a massive driver for people like housing associations. Um, or homeowners that just want to get retrofitted uh, as quickly as possible and back into their homes. So it's not just me saying this, there's a bunch of people around the country uh, and the world that have used our product in lots of different applications, Victorian townhouses, beautiful listed properties, um, builders and plasterers that have only ever used multi-finish that just pick our product up. It's been using some pretty cool projects that are super high end, but done by developers and and large contractors, um, and then covered by some interesting magazines. Um, this is that project in Mayfair, um, which we really went for a textured natural feel on this one. It was a really about telling a story about the plant power plaster and the hemp coming through and in, into the, the fabric of the building, connecting people back to that third skin of the building, um, which is so important, of course, our shelter. This is Cost as a clothing store in, in Antwerp and, and around the world. They use our plaster. This is a high end high-end project in Frankie do lots of high-end ironmongery for the uh, London market and then you know heritage uh, restoration projects that are a higher end and then you've got your sustainable eco builds it's a project in Israel um, they um, you know they're using hempcrete blocks and, and our product is also compatible with with hempcrete so it's been used in a bunch of different applications. Um, this is a, a whistle top st stop tour. Um, I think, uh, I hope um, people can see that the work is about collaboration with partners to be able to, it's a two way feedback loop as well. You know, we're willing to and happy to talk to people about how we can improve our offerings um, to you guys. Um, and if you would like to order a sample box to see a bit more or get some more technical detail, please phone us uh, or, or order one at info at Adaptivate. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. Very much looking forward to seeing your product uh, taking over the world. Um, <laughs> next, we've got Barbara Jones from the School of Natural Building. So Barbara is the founder of the School of Natural Building and she is a trained carpenter and a joiner as well as an expert in straw construction. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Barbara was awarded both a Lifetime Achievement Award from Women in Construction and UKRC Women of Outstanding Achievement Award. So, um, over to Barbara. Great, thanks, Oro. And uh, I'll just share my screen quickly. And, uh, that's it. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for that intro. Um, unlike uh, the previous two, I'm not a product manufacturer. I'm a 
the sort of Jill of all trades, if you like. I'm a, a, a builder, I'm a trainer, I'm a designer and a consultant. And um, I've been working with Lime for a very long time now, but at the other end of the scale, if you like, I'm just delighted that um, Cornish Lime and Adaptive Ace are going so far into the professional application of Lime because that's where we need to go. I've worked uh, an awful lot with self builders and with training on site and novices who've never worked with Lime before to get really quite exemplar buildings um, uh, finished using people who've, who are not professional plasterers. So I'll just, um, I'm, I'm gonna show you quite a lot of pictures and uh, talk a bit about how that journey has gone over the years. So first of all, um, how long have lime renders, mortars and plasters been around? I know you've already heard a bit about this from Ed, but um, they actually go back further than you might think. So there are examples of lime being used 12,000 years ago. And so it's, it's a really tried and tested material. So all of those qualities and benefits that Tom was talking about to do with Adaptivate are, to, are connected, are the same qualities and benefits that all lime plasters have, unless they have um, particular sorts of modern additives put into them. So the, what, what I've tried to do is stay with the simplicity of the original types of lime and use those for the buildings that I've been uh, involved in. If I can get it to move on. So lime was used by all ancient cultures and it was used for floors, for pavements, for mortars and renders and plasters and particularly used for waterproofing in aqueducts and water tanks. So I think it's really important to remember our history and to remember that we're talking about something that has been used in ancient and traditional and heritage buildings as well as in modern buildings and urban buildings and the um, industrial revolutionized civilizations. So throughout its history, it's been used predominantly for most of, the, most of the buildings in the world will have had some sort of lime on it. So just going back to the Greeks, who we know very well from um, as engineers and builders, this is, this is one of the oldest still existing Greek structures built with lime mortar and with lime renders and plasters. They, um, the plasters aren't there particularly anymore, but the lime mortars definitely are. So we still have in existence buildings that are 2,000 years, two and a half thousand years old and still going strong. That is testament to the durability and the longevity of limes. Sorry, my slides aren't moving on as I would like them to. This is, this is one of my most favorite buildings in the world, the Pantheon in Rome, again, built um, 2000 years ago, still there, you can go and see it. It's massive and it was centuries before anybody could build anything this size uh, with cement. With cement, it's not, it, it, was, it took an awful long time for them to be able to build something like this with cement. And um, the geometry of it is exquisite. And they, they've done it by using different types of lime and different types of additives, pozzolans, at different places in the building to deal with the weight as you go up high. But lime renders can be used on lots and lots of different substrates. So here we've got an example from the Weald and Downland Museum, which is a fantastic place to go and look at older buildings. So lime can be put onto um, wattle and daub, which uh, is, is the infill in this house, but it could also be brick in the old timber frame buildings. Generally, lime isn't put onto 
timber because it doesn't stick very well without some form of substrate onto the timber, but you can lime wash directly onto timber. And our traditional cob buildings, of which there are over 100,000 in the UK, a lot of people don't even know that, which are made of monolithic clay with a lime plaster on the outside. So you see hundreds of villagers with houses like this, very often thatched, sometimes the thatch has been changed now, which are made of earth and have a lime plaster on them. So these lime plasters, the old lime plasters, would almost definitely have been the non-hydraulic limes or artificially made hydraulic limes because there's not very much natural hydraulic lime available in the UK. There is in, in France and other Europe, European countries, but not in the UK. So most of these older buildings would have had weekly hydraulic limes or pure limes on them. And here um, we've got modern cob buildings. There's not very many of those being built because they're so expensive, but um, um, what's his name, McCabe, Kevin McCabe has been building some amazing ones. And these also get lime plastered because of the breathability of lime uh, as a, uh, and the way it adheres to monolithic clay. It's not something that you would put on a thin layer of clay, but it is something you would put on monolithic clay. Around the world, all sorts of different buildings have been plastered with lime moving into the modern era. And my particular specialism is straw bale building. And I've worked with Werner Schmidt and Margareta Schwartz, um, not on these buildings, but they are fantastic architects and have worked with the big jumbo bales. And again, um, this is reasonably hand applied plaster. So these are practitioners who work with, with contractors who, who put the plaster on uh, by hand rather than by mechanical methods. This is, this is one that, uh, that we did in Wales. And it's the, it's the first two-story load-bearing straw building in the UK ever built. And you can see what's important about this particular picture is that you can see the hand, hand applied nature of the plaster. As, as the years go by, you will see that we've improved our teaching techniques so that you would hardly notice the difference between the trainee built, trainee plastered ones and the late and the um, professionally plastered ones. Um, the fine art exhibition, fine art and antiques auction house near Stansted Airport plastered by professional plasterers, um, a very effective straw bale building as well for them. The North Kestevan council houses, we did two pairs of council houses and then the government in their wisdom decided that councils were not allowed to build their own houses anymore. But this achieved 2.62 air changes per hour before passive house was a thing. So there's no tapes, no membranes, the lime plaster is the airtight layer. And we've done some other buildings like that as well. There's, uh, I won't go into these details, but I've included them so that you can see them on the PDF later. The case studies about that. Straw vaults, um, all sorts of different types of buildings plastered with, um, with different products, mostly very simple products. Here we get into self-build. Would you believe this is a self-build terrace of houses? It's a very professionally finished series of three two-story houses built by uh, our clients. And, and we went down there and helped them by, by teaching training courses. And you can see here part of that happening. And um, these were built for 750 pounds a square meter. That's why people do their own plastering because you can take the labor cost out and it's perfectly possible to do it with, with the uh, pure limes and the hydraulic limes, but you need to um, take the time over it. it they, take, they take time and aftercare, which is what Adaptivate is, is aiming to take out of the process 
but if you keep that in, the material cost can be, can be quite low if you do it yourself. Um, so here we've got the link that we need to be making between the heritage sector and the modern natural material sector. So this is actually a very modern, uh, almost passive house in Norfolk, but it looks like a traditional building. And again, there's a case study that goes with that, but um, this is another passive house, again, without a frame. And the, the lime on here was spray applied. And what I should say about uh, the limes that we use is that we've been using um, hemp as the fiber for 20 years. In fact, um, Wormersley's in West Yorkshire started making lime plasters with hemp because I asked them to um, all that time ago because I discovered it being used in France in the late 90s. This is another gorgeous building in um, London that you can go and have a cup of tea in and it's it's all lime plastered. So what we're building here with with the lime plastered buildings is the breathability and the durability. So we're talking about buildings that will potentially last more than 100 years, not the 60 years or the 40 years that modern modern contractors build to because we're using materials that have a proven track record of longevity through their, their flexibility. The Curden Valley Park Visitor Centre is another um, completely, completely built by trainees. So the volunteers from the park and students on our courses built this whole building and they did all the plaster finishes. And so it's a, it's a phenomenal building. It's very, very popular. It's, it's far too popular because the cafe's just over expanded now. Everyone wants to go there. But it's, it's a really good example of the quality that's possible by just using trainees and keeping the costs of building down. Um, I've just come back from the South Coast where the Hastings Visitor Centre has been uh, opened officially a year after it's actually opened. It's a fantastic building, again, built by the uh, Upstraw Partnership. So the School of Natural Building is a partner in the Interreg funded um, program that commissioned this building, which was built by a consortium of, of local contractors. And we're now moving into the 21st century big time mass housing being produced by prefabricated straw panels with eco cocon. Again, lime plastered on wood fiber board on the outside using um, warranty. They need to have warranted lime uh, systems. So Adaptivate would be perfect for something like this. Um, so in terms of specification, We've written a technical guide to straw bale construction, which includes sample specifications for working with lime. These are, these are the simple limes, the ones that um, you can buy in quite a number of uh, uh, places around the country. They are not the products like Adaptivate is producing. These are, these are, limes that can be specified for any building and there's options for using lime putty as the binder for hydraulic lime as the binder or hot lime as the binder so just really simple recipes to begin the journey for looking at specifications um, i know that a lot of people were thinking about, have been thinking about limecrete as well. And I did mention that right at the beginning that lime has been used for pavements and for flooring for a very, very long time. The Romans were expert at using lime. We nowadays call that limecrete and it would be made with a, a, a strong natural hydraulic lime, an NHL5. Um, and those, those limes are um, readily, they're readily available and the, the methods and the techniques are, are really well known. Timaua lime has pioneered using limecrete. 
Mike Y also uses LimeCrete. You can look at both those websites to find out more about them. So um, there's a database about all sorts of things on the Zotero. And if when you get the PowerPoint, you can contact that. And that's all I'm going to talk about for now and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. That was great. Good to see such a variety of projects. And uh, on the Lime Crete, I think we'll organize another event on all the Crete things. So Hem Crete, Lime Crete and all. Um, so I will now open our Q&A session. So please keep posting a question in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them all. Um, so if we can have all the speakers, perfect. So maybe I'll start with a question from Claude um, on the question of skills. And Claude is asking, does it require more skills to use natural, uh, traditional types, to use traditional types of line? I guess it's um, compared to uh, like more traditional products. Who wants to? I think it's, uh, I would say it doesn't require more skill. The, the skill set is really very similar. What it requires and, and Ed and Tom have both said the same thing. It requires aftercare, which a lot of contractors just really don't want to do and don't understand. And so their lime can fail and it's because they failed rather than the product. And that's what Adaptivate is aiming to do and Cornish Lime are aiming to do is to get products on the market that behave in more similar ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and especially, especially formulate the product um, in a way that, that, that it can, you minimize that, that flash drying is typically what, what the problem is. I mean, you can kind of formulate the product to be able to mitigate against that risk. Um, but also, I guess there's an awareness and a positioning thing as well in terms of supporting people and, and that sort of thing um, that we're, we're trying hard to do with with uh with what, what with our activities but i think with breather plaster was you know from my built building background i sort of wanted to get the performance benefits and the breathability benefits you know i used to be a stonemason and 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 plaster boarding and and lime plastering and that sort of thing and hemp creating with people like will stanix and al sparrow and you know and i just wanted to be able to get these benefits of these wonderful products into the hands of as many people as possible um so that we can have healthier people in healthy buildings you know Thank you. Maybe it's time for um, asking because quite a few people were asking what is the importance of breathable material in like lime in heritage uh, projects. So, I'm, I'm happy to jump on that one if, if unless you want to, Ed. I mean, this is in your this is in your wheelhouse, mate. But I'm happy to jump on it. I mean, yeah, you can jump in if you want or interrupt me if you want. I mean, it's um, in terms of sort of like when you're looking at historic buildings where you're looking at solid wall composite, um, a, a lot of the time they will have been built with lime originally, or they would have been built with um, earth mortars, or sometimes they, as, as Barbara said, they are literally just cob, they're shuttered earth um, or in shuttered clay. And when you're dealing with these materials, which will readily absorb moisture already, um, what you and, and you've got these big monolithic walls, which can be however long they are with absolutely no expansion joints or anything like that. You need to have to start with something which is flexible, which is able to deal with the movement of a sort of expansion and contraction as it heats and cools. But at the same time, what you don't want is to have um, something in the joint, which is a plug. So if water is able to get into the wall at any point, it can't then escape again. And that's where the, in the images in my presentation you saw there was the um, uh, the degradation of the stone. The stone starts weathering away preferentially over the mortar joint. So as a result, you actually end up losing a historic material, but B, you end up losing the profile of the wall, which is it is you know you you can basically destroy a beautiful building by inappropriate use of of modern materials. Um, so it's sort of the the there's a number of reasons for for using lime within sort of the, the more conservation part of the market but the, the i think the main one is probably if you're actually starting to look at like how conservation how conservation principles are are set out and how they're followed it's typically sort of a like for like type replacement as it seemed to be 
a sympathetic repair, if that's, I think, a, a simple way to say it. If you've used something which is similar to what was there, which has been there for 300 years, then hopefully it will exist for another 300 years. Yeah, it's been a revolution that came with all these like vapor control layers and plasterboard mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Like they were all like unbreathable materials and they came in the kind of just post-war there or maybe a bit before. And, and, and the amount of stuff that I ended up taking out that was just not fit for purpose in those pre-1920 built homes, solid wall monolithic kind of buildings that Ed was talking about was just like crazy. And, and that was part of the reason why I wanted to develop a plasterboard that was used just like plastic, you know, that was used just like plasterboard, but could breathe with the building. And, and I think there's a real kind of uh, challenge as we move forward into the retrofit arena with a carbon lens, as you kind of go back to the start of my presentation there, if you just go into retrofit with a carbon lens, we're going to, we're going to screw it up. And so it's about actually having solutions that are scalable as well as being compatible um, uh, with people in buildings. Right. Thank you. Um, then staying with you, Ed, actually we've got a question from Cyprian. Yep. He's asking regarding R&D yeah. um, and mostly on research, um, where are the challenges for you at the moment? So, um, in terms of the research side of stuff, because you have asked more for research than development side of stuff, the development is, is not so much of a problem. It's find a problem and I, I make a solution for the problem, whether that problem be for a, a thousand year old building or whether that's a modern product for a, looking at a more modern market. Um, the research part of stuff is the part that which is um, very difficult to sort of like um, quantify. The reason I would say that is that um, when you're looking at laboratory testing results, they very often don't line up with what you would expect in real life. And that's because the standards which you follow within a laboratory environment are typically for, for manufacturing, therefore QA, therefore quality assurance for the product that you're actually making. So as a result, if you test a, a bar, which um, you've taken out of a steel bar mold for a compressive strength test, it will give you a measurable figure, hopefully a repeatable measurable figure. That's part of the QA process. Now, if you take that same product and you apply it to a wall, rather than putting it into a steel bar mold, you then have suction from the wall. The suction from the wall will enhance the wall to binder ratio, which will make it stronger. You then have somebody coming up and floating that up, which compacts it onto the wall, which again makes it stronger. So when you're looking at how, uh, I don't know, for example, a pore structure develops within a material, if you're looking at something which you've taken out of a bar mold, it's going to be completely different to how it actually behaves in situ, because your water binder ratio is a very sort of important concept when it comes to the pore size distribution as well as your average pore size. So in situ testing uh, and availability of kind of funding to a certain extent for that kind of work is it's it's very difficult to get hold of and when you do get it it's usually a relatively big product that you'd be working on um in, you know in terms of sort of other forms of research um availability of materials within the supply chain at the moment has been challenging so you go into uh, you, you can find a, if you find a material which solves a problem for you, sometimes either you actually then have difficulty getting hold of that uh, problem, uh, that material, sorry. Um, I mean, during the worst parts uh, towards the end of COVID there, where we're having issues with sort of um, um, lorry drivers, shortage of lorry drivers and the like, mm -hmm. there were certain materials that we were trying to order at the time, which we'd be having lead times of six to eight months on. So, you know, it's, it's maintaining stock and being able to then use these materials pulling them forward into usable products or, or solutions in, in various parts of the market. Great, thank you for your answer. Um, moving on to Barbara, um, we've got a question from Isaac and he is wondering what's your experience with fire when dealing with hemp and lime construction? And a uh, second question uh, uh, is about how, how do you integrate services and utilities in this kind of buildings? Well, um, lime plasters that contain hemp are just as fire resistant as, uh, as the tested gypsum plasters are. They, you know, it's to do with the thickness of the plaster, mostly. 12 mil will give you 30 minutes and um, 15 mil will give you 60 minutes protection, just as a general rule of thumb. And uh, that's what you do with plasterboard and skim with gypsum and modern materials mm. but um it so there's no they're not combustible materials and just because it's got hemp in it doesn't make it 
any more of, of a fire risk. And perhaps you're talking about the uh, insulating plaster that is maybe applied at about three inches thick, 75 mil thick, which is, uh, I call it lime hemp plaster, which is an insulating plaster and a really good DIY way of um, retrofitting your house to be, uh, to be more thermally efficient in a way that you can do yourself. Uh, you can either buy it as a product ready mixed or you can make it yourself from raw materials, which obviously is cheaper. And uh, that's also, it actually enhances the fire protection. It doesn't, it doesn't create fire risk. When you're doing services and utilities in the lime, it's, it's just the same as any other. Uh, in fact, it's easier in many ways to do services into a wet, where it's going to have a wet plaster than it is into cutting through plasterboard um, because of the um, having to get the holes all in the right place with plasterboard. With, with a wet plaster, whether it's lime or gypsum or, or bonding, then it covers over everything mm -hmm. once you've put it in. It's just the same. So you stay in same. first and then you cover? Yeah, it, it depends what substrate you're mm -hmm. going on to. Obviously, I work mostly with straw, and so mm. we'd be putting the putting the cabling in first, and then covering it over with the, with the wet okay. plaster, lime, or clay plaster. Right. Thank you. Um, then we've got a question from Justine, and she's asking how you would recommend dealing with issues such as soundproofing in modern development with thick stone walls. I guess that's a bit of retrofit. Asking whether lime would provide that or. Um, would you have to use soundproofing plasterboard? I expect there's some specialist lime. Um, I think Ed mentioned that, and maybe Tom, whoever wants to. I think on, on this, it's it's. I don't think um, I don't think these things can sort of be seen in isolation. So one of the key pieces of work that we're doing at the moment is that the mainstream market, the kind of commercial and all those kind of large contractors, procure not just products; they procure systems, which are combinations of products. And so all the architects on the call will know that, you know, in what your lives are like, you know, the white book or whatever, you know, in terms of what DB rating or what fire rating for different particular applications, shell and core into fit out, you know, and, and it's less in a domestic setting, but for new build particularly, it's all done on systems. And so it's not just a material um, performance characteristic, it's actually the whole system. And that's what Adaptivate's focus is on next year is about taking our products and putting them into systems for it, making it easy to specify with confidence in particular applications. For instance, the big ones are sound and fire. And it's not just a material property necessarily. Um, uh, you know, it's as Barbara kind of said as well, it's, it's not just the straw or, you know, um, or just the lime. It's, it's how those things kind of go together as a system. Um, and what we're really focused on is trying to take our kind of everyday usable materials and put them into systems for the mainstream market to, 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 to specify um both for the commercial like the the, the 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 commercial side of it and the domestic side of it and there'll be different drivers and regulations in each one of those um i hope that's answered the question a little bit justine yeah i think i wonder if someone wants to touch on like maybe um lime renders with cork aggregates and things like that are, are quite good i suppose for acoustics and insulation yes i've actually used uh, lime with cork um, it's quite a weird plaster to put on the wall and it, it still feels a little bit squashy afterwards. But um, I don't know what the figures are, the technical details are, but it definitely does add to um, insulation and acoustic barriers to some extent. Someone was asking about um, whether lime kind of question lime can be applied to um, wood fiber boards which i suppose would be good also for acoustic in turn so definitely it can yeah, yeah so instead of um insulated plaster, acoustic plasterboard can be a mix of wood fiber boards and a lime render i suppose yeah i i sent uh i can't remember who it was oh it's Gre grecia I sent her a link to our install guide for wood fiber and wood wool. Perfect. So if you're looking for an alternative um, board that's, you know, not breather board, because um, either you can't get it yet or um, you don't want to use it, um, then there are other boards available um, that are alternatives to plasterboard and uh, wood fiber board and wood wool boards are 
really good ones and, and Cornish Lime stock them and um, particularly the wool boards. And, and there's, again, it's a specification guide to a system. It's how the board interacts with the plaster, but absolutely those, those two things are very compatible. Good. I guess that answered the question. And then um, I'm aware we're over eight o'clock, which is a couple of questions to wrap up. Um, got a question from Elliot, interesting regarding the possible use of lime mortar and brick to build a wall without expansion joints and would even lime not be able to expand and contract and or, or would even lime not be able to extend and contract eventually and fail eventually and he says he's here he is hearing a lot of contradictory information on this um who wants to yeah, I already answered that one in the yeah. chat. Um, we've yeah. just got we've got loads and loads of examples of miles and miles of wall built with brick and lime mortar and no expansion joints. They're very old and they're not failing. Yes, you can do it. And it's a much more beautiful finish than seeing a modern building with those ugly expansion joints every three meters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, I'm going to ask one last question from Debbie, and Debbie is asking you, what development in Lyme do you see as a potential, as potentially having the most impact for mainstream construction? That's a very bold question. There's so many. <laughs> There's the thing is that Lyme, Lyme is not just this single thing. You have, you have everything from your your ultra flexible, very high reabsorption of carbon dioxide, um, sort of very high free lime content mixes all the way through to your sort of borderline, like early port and cement sort of very, very eminently strongly hydraulic natural, uh, naturally hydraulic limes in this country. So the kind of the spectrum of materials there means that there's, I don't think there's any single thing that you can kind of point because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be different things for different parts i think probably the the biggest development that i could see going forwards would be an improvement in the education of the yeah. people who are actually using the materials the more people who know about them the more people who know under how to how to use them the more that people that understand the limitations but at the same time understand the benefits of the different types of material that's the point where we'll start to see mass adoption or, or much larger adoption in my opinion yeah, that, so that brings me to Blanche's comments. Who Blanche is a student at the Bartlett, and she would like to get the Bartlett involved into Lyme. So I think we need to put all of you in touch with her and um, bring Lyme into universities. Sounds good to me. Start there. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. I could, just, could I answer that question on Lyme and, and the future of it? Just very no, briefly, sorry. and everyone wants to go and have their veggie burgers and whatnot and a glass of wine probably if you're not already doing that but um so um uh, well what we're trying to do is make exactly what ed just said you know make it easy for everyone to to use where i think there's some really interesting thing is actually in this carbon capture potential of lime so lime emits co2 when it's slaked when it's burnt sorry when it's when it's uh, it fired but then it's also really good at absorbing it. And so what Adaptivation has been funded by Innovate UK to do is to look at that accelerated carbonation. So instead of it being years, take it down to hours and days. And we prove that we can do that in the industrial setting. What's really cool is when you combine that with um, companies that are making zero carbon lime. So taking the CO2, reducing the amount of CO2 that's emitted when the lime's made, and then putting that into forms of sequestration. Uh, long-term sequestration storage. So you can use carbon capture and utilization in products like ours that can absorb CO2 in the industrial processes. But if that lime has got a zero carbon attributed to it, because you've been able to capture that CO2 at burning and squirrel it into a sequestered 100 year plus, then you've got a carbon capture and storage and a utilization. And that's a meaningful way in which we can industrially scale these materials. And it's more complex than I'm making out right now. And there's a lot of carbon modeling that needs to be done to make sure it's an appropriate and scalable solution. But if you can combine those two things, carbon capture and storage in lime industry, the carbon capture and utilization into commodity products like stuff like we're all doing, then um, there is a significant carbon capture potential of these materials. Um, because of course, you know, that lime is, is a cycle. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting area of, of future development. Mm. Yeah. 
Would, do you want to add anything, Barbara? Or... <laughs> Um, well, my my area is not is not uh, major house development and commercial development. Um, I'm working at the other end of the scale with self builders, so I'm interested in keeping everything as simple as possible, where you can work from the raw materials and make very very cheap plasters that will still last hundreds of years. So I think there's always going to be uh, room for that. Community, community builds are always going to have to be able to do things themselves to save money because they just don't have the budgets that the big contractors have. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, good one to finish on. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to our speakers. Um, so it's been a pleasure. And I'm just going to wrap up with what we're doing over the next few months at ACAN. So we'll be holding more natural material events with our next master class in July for a session focused on coatings and finishes. I also have to say that next week on the 16th, uh, there is an existing building retrofit coordinator event. It's an ACAN broad uh, event that will be in person in London and on Zoom. So you can just go on the ACAN website and check it out. Um, I have to say that ACAN is a voluntary organization. So if you'd like to donate to fund events like this, we'll post a link in the chat now. To help us understand our audience better and to highlight the main barriers to using natural materials, we are currently running a survey. Please do participate if you haven't already. The link will be posted in the chat now. And finally, if you'd like to join us at ACAN Natural Materials, the link in, to the WhatsApp group will be also posted in the chat or you can email us at naturalmaterials at architectscan.org. Um, there will be a follow-up party bag with a roundup of this event, information on the speakers and further resources. So do watch out for that in your inbox soon. It will come from Evan Bright. So thank you again to all of our speakers for a brilliant evening and thank you everybody for coming. We hope to see you all again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>